So I've just dropped my wife off at a school reunion and I've got a couple of hours to fill. So option A is to aimlessly wander the dirty mean streets of Bath. Option B is to turn into my alter ego of Lycra Lout and go exploring. And you just knew it would be choice B. And the first point of call after dropping Mary off at the restaurant is the towpath of the Kennet and Avon Canal. How I make these films is first do the ride and second do the historical research adding it in the edit. This film bit me in the bum somewhat as the more I look into the history of the places on this ride the more I find. I found so much more history that I'd like to include producing this film than any of the previous ones. If I start rambling go and make a cup of tea or hit mute. So the canal we're riding next to, the Kennet and Avon. It starts on the River Thames at Reading. The River Kennet, a tributary of the Thames, was made navigable to Newbury in 1793 by adding a few locks. It slowly meanders its way through the town following the original river's route. The canal was opened in 1810 and runs from Newbury through Hungerford and Devizes. From Devizes, the canal goes downhill, literally, to Bradford-on-Avon and takes a nice, slow ramble through the city of Bath. It joins up with the River Avon and heads to towards Bristol. Riding the towpath you realise that a lot of effort went into building these things. So why go to all that effort? Prior to canals the main way of shifting bulky goods was either by horse and cart or by sea. Shifting large items by sea works but what if the place you wanted to shift stuff from or to is inland? Romans to the rescue! The Romans built the first canal in England around AD 50 to move goods between Lincoln and the River Trent. They built a few of them, so maybe canals need to be in addition to the what have the Romans ever done for us sketch in Life of Brian. Well, oh, flipping heck. Coming through now, I've got the chain back on. Oh, not again. What a crappy bike. Might finally make it past you at this rate. Thank you. Cheers. Whoa, better slow down here. Most definitely better slow down, otherwise I can see himself in the drink. After the Romans, we did tinker with inland waterways by making some rivers navigable and building the odd canal. Then along comes the Industrial Revolution and all of a sudden, large quantities of coal, clay, iron ore and finished products need to be moved about. One horse could tow ten times as much on a boat than it could on a cart, so rich industrialists such as Josiah Wedgwood invested in canals. He was behind the Trenton Mersey Canal. He wanted to bring bulk cargoes of clay in one factory door and shift finished pottery out the other, and crucially get it to market without it being smashed to bits every time the horse and cart hit a pothole. These lovely houses on the side of the canal. This is Bathampton, a lovely stop, great pub. Bathampton's odd facts claim to fame is that it's the home of plasticine. William Harbert studied art in London and moved to Bath to teach. He used clay for modelling but wanted something that didn't dry out as quickly so that his students could make changes to their work before it set rock hard. So he tinkered away in his basement laboratory and invented plasticine. He only intended to use it in his classes but when the students and all their mates started taking it home to play with he thought Hmm. He patented it in 1899 and had a factory in Bathampton on the canal that produced it there until 1983. There's no trace of the factory now, just a close of houses named after him. Don't know what they're burning. Oh, they're dangerous buggers, aren't they? Although canal routes were meticulously planned to avoid inconvenient geographical features, some of them had to be tackled head on. The Kennet and Avon has a couple of places that tested the canal builder's ingenuity. The summit of the canal is southeast of Marlborough in the Savernac Forest. The landowner was okay with the canal but wouldn't allow a cutting, so a 500 metre tunnel was built through the hill. Canal tunnels usually had no towpath, the horses went over the top and the barges were manually legged through. This tunnel was wide enough for two boats, so a series of chains was used to pull barges through. So if the canal was at the top of a hill, how did it have water in it? There are several springs and small streams within a mile or so. Water was diverted from these to a reservoir and a massive pumping station was built to feed the tunnel. Nowadays the water is pumped electrically, but the original Cornish steam engine is still in action on special days. Another major engineering feat was Cane Hill Locks near Devizes. It's easy to get downhill on a river, assuming it's deep enough, but getting up is another thing. Over two miles, the river drops 72 metres. There are 29 locks in all, with 16 of them very close together on the steepest bit. Note the pond, or pound, next to each lock. They are necessary to fill up the lock again after each use. Water is also pumped back up the hill at a rate of one full lock every 11 minutes. In case you're curious, going up or down these locks takes six hours. Ah, oh, now there are these bridges then. 
By 1815, the canal building boom was over, and within a decade, investors had moved on to the next big thing, railways. At first, railways and canals coexisted, but as the rail network became more and more connected, canal traffic declined. Canal companies slashed charges to try and remain in the game. Boatmen's wages slumped, and the only way they could afford to keep their families was by taking them with them on the boats. The railway companies bought out many loss-making canals, either to close them down or build a railway where the canal once was. Then came the next big thing, decent roads. We all know what the roads and Dr Beeching did to the railways. With the roads and railways having a stranglehold on goods traffic, most canals fell into disrepair and were simply abandoned to nature, the Kennet and Avon included. For me, the saddest images are what became of the Cane Hill Locks. These pictures were taken in the 1970s. Sorry, can you squeeze by there, all right? Yeah, not that fat. Well, I am. <laughs> no, you're all right. <laughs> the fortunes of canals took a turn for the better in the 1950s and 1960s when canals started to be used for leisure, and it's reckoned that there are more boats using the canals of Britain today than during their commercial heyday. The Kennet and Avon has been restored thanks to a massive effort by volunteers, and the Queen officially reopened it in 1990. Moving on, we come to Brass Knocker Basin, the spaghetti junction of Somerset Canals. It's a T-junction and we've just come at it from the right fork. The bottom fork is the Kennet and Avon heading towards Devizes, the North and London, and the left fork is the Somerset Coal Canal. Coal has been mined in Somerset since the 15th century. This is Kilmerston Colliery, just south of Radstock in 1970. There's no visible sign it ever existed now, but the winding wheel forms part of this monument in Radstock. At one point, the coal field had 75 mines, and to transport the stuff out to the big cities, a canal was built to connect the coal field with the Kennet and Avon. A second branch was built, but it was underused and eventually sold to the Somerset and Dorset Railway, who filled it in and laid tracks to form part of the line to Bath. The railways killed off the main branch of the coal canal, and it ended up being partially filled in, had tracks laid, and formed part of the Great Western Route from Camerton to Limpley Stoke. If you're of a certain age, you'll remember the Ealing comedy, The Titchfield Thunderbolt. The Camerton to Limpley Stoke branch line shut in 1951, but was reopened temporarily to do location filming. A lot of the movie was shot at various locations along the line. Going back to the Kennet and Avon, the canal mainly follows a parallel path south of the River Avon, but when it hits the Limpley Stoke Valley, it runs up against a couple of natural obstacles, so switches sides at Avoncliff. The thing they were trying to avoid was having to build a dirty great big aqueduct over this long valley. The road viaduct was built later. It follows the north side for a bit and switches back again here at the Dundas Aqueduct. The architect of this glorious grade 1 pile was John Rennie, who also designed the Cane Hill Locks of Devizes and Waterloo Bridge in London. The problem with aqueducts is that they leak, and Dundas was closed in 1954. Rather than fix the leaks, the canal was blocked and the aqueduct was dry for much of the 1960s and 70s. You could walk on the aqueduct bed as well as the canal bed on both sides of the river. Over the years it's been restored, and during the restoration people used it as a walking or jogging path, and Brassknocker Basin was used as an unofficial skateboard park. After restoration it reopened in 1984. Time to leave the rather gloriously named Brassknocker Basin. In case you were wondering why it's called Brassknocker Basin, it's because it's at the bottom of Brassknocker Hill, which is itself named after a pub at the top called the Brassknocker Inn. The pub had a very distinctive door knocker made out of brass. The pub got renamed the Crown Inn and was later turned into houses and just to cap it all, the area at the bottom of the hill is known as Brass Knocker Bottom. We start by cutting across country from the canal, and after much huffing puffing and a very large amount of swearing, we join the remains of the Somerset and Dorset Railway, currently known as the Twin Tunnels Greenway. We join the old Somerset and Dorset track just after Midford, and the first thing you come across is this massive viaduct at Tucking Mill. Tucking Mill produced Fuller's Earth, a clay-based material that's been used in the wool industry since time immemorial. It was pretty gosh darn good at removing oil and grease from fleeces, but most importantly, provided an easy way to remove dingleberries. Just after the Tucking Mill viaduct, we come to the Coombe Down Tunnel. After the beaching axe, the tunnel was boarded up and left to nature. Thanks to £4 million invested in the Greenway, it's now the longest cycling tunnel in Britain. The tunnel was opened in 1874 and is just over a mile long. It was always unpopular with engine crews because it was the longest unventilated railway tunnel in Britain. 
that and it being haunted. The lack of ventilation caused a serious accident in 1929. A heavy goods train left Midford Station from a standing start with the engine at the front. The section from Midford to the start of the tunnel is uphill and the train couldn't get up enough speed to go through the tunnel quickly. As the train moved slowly through the tunnel, the driver and fireman were overcome by smoke and fell unconscious, poisoned by carbon monoxide. The train continued upwards through the Devonshire Tunnel, then it's a clear downhill run right into Bath Green Park Station. It it sailed through several sets of points and derailed in the goods yard, killing the driver, fireman and a yard inspector in this cabin. The Board of Investigation didn't go with having the tunnel ventilated, that would cost too much money, but recommended that the loads trains carried were reduced or two engines were used. To be fair, the tunnel had already been in use for half a century with no similar accident and none since. So we're about 200 metres for the edge of the tunnel. Well, it's 100 metres from the edge of the tunnel. Uh, it's been a mile of blissful, quiet cycling. And we're coming to the end of it. To be talk shop now. Tunnel number two coming up. After the Coombe Down Tunnel, there's a short section in the open. Then it's into the Devonshire Tunnel. This one's a fair bit shorter at around 400 metres as opposed to just over a mile. Now, if I'm not very much mistaken, that's a slow. It is indeed. After the Devonshire Tunnel, it's about a mile and a half to where the Greenway crosses the current Bath to Bristol railway line and we turn off to cross the River Avon. I did this ride on a cool grey autumn day and really enjoyed it, but it must be absolutely glorious in the summer. The route I'm taking turns left here to head towards the river crossing, but going straight on is the line into Green Park Station. The runaway train came right through this way. Much of the route from here on in has been built over, but Green Park Station is still there. It's been restored after a period of decay post beaching and is now a car park and closed market. So it's over the River Avon and onto the Bristol and Bath railway path, a walking and cycling route between the two cities. It starts off as the Kennet and Avon Canal towpath and as it leaves Bath it takes the line of the Midland Railway branch line from Green Park in Bath to Mangotts Field in Bristol. I'm going to ride that next year. We leave the towpath and head into Central Bath. The route through Central Bath starts with Royal Crescent. When I mentioned the dirty mean streets of Bath earlier on, I was referring to this lot. When it was built, purchasers didn't buy a house but a length of the facade. Some bought two sections, so not every front door represents a separate house. You then got your own architect to build whatever you wanted behind the facade. Many planned cities did this and it's described as Queen Anne front and Mary Anne back. An American expression meaning appears high class but commonplace in reality. The British synonym I rather liked was all fur coat and no knickers. Not sure that Royal Crescent is usually described like that. In 1942, Bath was heavily bombed. Numbers 2 and 17 were hit by incendiaries and burnt out. There was a housing shortage post-war and the council bought these two houses and a lot of other empty properties in the area for renting out. Most returned to private ownership with the right to buy, but some of these are still in public ownership, including one of these. I don't know which one. No idea what a house here would cost today, but a two-bed basement flat is currently on the market for 850k. In the 1950s, you could pick up a whole vacant house here for 4k. A third of these are still townhouses but most have been converted to flats. One is a hotel and one a museum. The whole lot is of course grade one listed. Moving on from Royal Crescent we come to the circus. This is modelled on Stonehenge. Bear with me on this. The architect John Wood was a Bathonian. He was also an historian, surveyor and mad keen on druids. He did what is still one of the best surveys of Stonehenge ever carried out, down to quarter of an inch. He wanted to restore Bath to what he believed was its former ancient glory, but his plans were consistently knocked back by vested interests. So he decided to build outside the city walls on Greenfield. The land was owned by Robert Gay and Gay Street is named in his honour. Building started in 1754 and it was the first of the major out of town developments and the style setter. Okay, the Stonehenge connection. Based on his survey of Stonehenge, he decided that the perfect diameter of the circus would be the diameter of Stonehenge. Next up is Pulteney Bridge and Great Pulteney Street, the third major out of town development. The bridge was built to cross the Avon and provide access to future land developments. 
The original one lasted 20 years before it was wrecked by storms but was rebuilt to the same design. The shops came later and all sorts of cantilevers were added to expand retail space. Eventually, the bridge and road were widened. The city of Bath wanted to expand the city boundaries and Sir William Pulteney's estate was conveniently just over the river. So he built the bridge and Great Pulteney Street to be a grand approach leading to what he hoped would be an equally grand development. This fountain in Laura Place wasn't part of the original plan. After completion, residents camp campaigned and fundraised to build a Nelson's column alike. During the build, they realised it would be too big, so campaigned again, this time to have it cancelled. The compromise was to rip it down and install a fountain instead. During Freshers' Week in 1969, it was wrecked, so a modern one was installed in 1970. Kids, eh? Originally, the street was lined with trees, but come autumn, leaves became a problem, one which the council were asked to solve, and in true town hall logic, their solution was to chop them all down. So what happened with the Grand Pulteney development this road was leading to? It didn't happen and Pulteney Street ended up being the last grand development in Bath. The financial climate changed drastically in the 1790s, followed by the Napoleonic Wars and a depression in 1807. Just around the corner of Great Pulteney Street is Sydney Place and Jane Austen lived at number 4 between 1801 and 1804. And it's back to the restaurant just in time to pick up Mary. When I was doing the Google Earth sequences, I spotted this little oddity. Did somebody build a house over a canal, or did somebody dig a canal under a house? To answer this, we need to look at Sydney Gardens next door. Sydney Gardens were laid out in the 1790s as commercial pleasure gardens, with paid attractions such as a maze, grotto, public galas and public breakfasts. Jane Austen's house bordered the gardens, and she was a regular visitor. The thing about Bath is that it's pretty hilly. There aren't too many opportunities to put flat things such as canals or railways through the landscape. So the canal was built through the gardens with some conditions. Two tunnels had to be built to take it under the existing park perimeter roads and the gardens owners insisted on these fancy iron bridges paid for by the canal company. Cleveland House was built 20 years after the canal by the canal company and used as their head office for the next 50 odd years. There's a small hatch in the basement opening into the tunnel. It's rumoured the hatch was to pass paperwork between boats and the office but the truth of it appears to be they used it to dump rubbish into the canal. Isambard Kingdom Brunel used one of the offices in the 1830s. Was he working for the canal company? No, he was surveying a route for the competition, the Great Western Railway from London to Bristol. The line opened in 1840, cutting through the gardens in a much more obtrusive manner. This find has inspired me to go back and ride the towpath between Bath and Bristol next year. I'm sure there's plenty more history to explore.